The era of big coal and big oil is in decline. We need to usher in a new era of big restoration, but we already have people working in that space, some for several decades now. Whilst this webinar is titled The New Movement of Hope for Nature, managing land for conservation in vast areas has been done for thousands of years by Indigenous peoples. I want to acknowledge their work and their knowledge. I would like to invite Bangarang woman Jai Atkinson to say a few words. So I'll hand over to you, Jai. Thank you, Gabby. Good evening, everybody. Bunga, Yobaga, Wata, Yakuma, Thora, John Paul Memorial Lecture 2023. Gaunyan Nini, Yakaramja, Guli Waka, Damala, Nana, Dumala, Wamaya, Waka, Gaunyan, Yakaramja, Yinbena, Yakapna, Bangarang, Moirajiban, Golinjibang, Walithika, Kalithiban, Klak, 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 Nadimoro, Yangruban, Darumban, Bangarban, Wangarban, Balotkaban. Good evening, all, and welcome to the John Paul Memorial Lecture Series 2023. Before we officially start, I'd like to firstly pay my respects to the spirits of this country, to the grandmothers and grandfathers of all Indigenous people of this country, and to my ancestors and elders, and to the Bangarang. The 11 clans of the Bangarang Nation, Moirajaban, Dolingyagan, Walithika, Kalithiban, Kwakwak, Narimoro, Yangduban, Doranban, Bungatban, Wangatpan, and Bikalatban. I'd like to extend my respect tonight to any Indigenous people online tonight. I'd like to acknowledge your connection to your traditional homelands and pay my respects to your ancestors and elders, past and present. My name is Jaira Atkinson. I'm a cultural liaison officer for Trust for Nature. I'm based in the northeast of Victoria. I'm a proud Bangarang woman. I work and live on my country. My clans are the Moirajiban and Kwak Kwak clans of the Bangarang Nation. My dad is the 10th generation unbroken patriarchal lineage of the Moirajiban clan, descendant of Nanny Kitty Atkinson. My mum is a descendant of Tommy McRae of the Kwak Kwak clan in the Bangarang Nation. For those who are tuning in from Bangarang country tonight, I'd like to say Yakima Dora Bangarang Waka, you are most welcome on Bangarang country. And for those who are far and wide, Yakima Dora Gaka Bangarang Waka, you are welcome to come to Bangarang country. Thank you for having me, Gabby. I'll pass it back to you. Uh, thank you so much for that welcome, Jai. That was fantastic and it's so exciting and lovely to hear that um, Bangarang language being spoken. Uh, so tonight's lecture is brought to you by Trust for Nature. And Trust for Nature works with willing landholders to permanently protect nature on private land. We're based in Victoria and we have now permanently protected over 100,000 hectares of habitat on private land and county. We receive support from governments for our work, but we also rely on the generosity of donors for what we do. So this annual lecture series was established to recognise the impact of John Paul and his family. So John was the, uh, the former director of the Dockers Plains Pastoral Company, which has Victoria's largest covenant at over a thousand hectares in size. Um, I'd like to thank very, very much um, Mary and the Paul family for this lecture tonight. So a bit of housekeeping, uh, over the next hour and a half, we will hear from each of our guest speakers. There will be time for a short panel discussion at the end. If you have a burning question, please type it into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer your questions. Some will be answered by our guest speakers via responses in the Q&A box or live during the panel discussions. So before I introduce our guest speakers, I wanna give you some context to tonight's topic. So ecological restoration is usually a direct response to damage humans have caused environments. From about the 1970s, there was increasing recognition that we needed to restore damaged ecosystems. Both in Australia and overseas, there have been a few large restoration projects, but most projects are small scale and fragmented. 
Many restoration projects, in Australia at least, are reliant on local communities and volunteers to plant trees and protect bush, usually with no higher coordination. In the early 2000s, most research was on the effect of fragmentation and degradation. There was almost no research on the positive side of the ledger. Thankfully, that has changed. There are now hundreds of studies and projects on how best to revegetate, how to restore, and how to return lost species. The Society for Ecological Restoration Australasia, started in 2011, links the now hundreds of restoration organisations across our region. And now the UN has declared it the decade of ecological restoration. So we're heading in the right direction. Here at Trust for Nature, we work across Victoria with over a thousand landholders who are passionate about managing their own patches of bush for conservation. All these amazing landholders make an enormous contribution to protecting and managing land in Victoria. Trust for Nature is involved in not just protecting, but also revegetating and restoring private land. We state in our strategic plan that we'll revegetate at least 5,000 hectares before 2025. An example of our work towards this can be seen here in northeast Victoria. Uh, in a collaborative project with the Northeast Catchment Management Authority, we've revegetated 260 hectares of private land under a Bush for Birds program. Uh, and you may have heard of the Victorian government's Bush Bank project, uh, which is an ambitious project to revegetate 20,000 hectares on private land. This project is a collaboration between Trust for Nature, Cassinia Environmental and the Victorian government. We, and we really look forward to seeing the ecological outcomes of this. Uh, so let's hear from our guest speakers. Uh, the three projects we are visiting tonight focus on two major things. Firstly, these three projects all restore really big areas. They've got a really big vision and are trying to link nature across broad landscapes. They all focus on linking the existing, existing fragments and these large scale connecting projects are typically called biolinks. By aiming big and creating large connections, they are hoping to not just restore nature in a patch, but restore the processes that underlie nature. The movement of native animals, the flow of water and genetics, providing habitat for highly mobile species. And the second thing these three projects focus on really importantly is connecting people. When you work across big areas, there are a big number of people for whom this is their backyard landscapes they emotionally connect to. So we've asked each of our guest speakers, what are the benefits for restoring big? How do you do this? What does this look like on the ground? And how do you connect and bring with you all the local people who are trying to do the right thing by their patch? So moving on to our guest speakers, I'm just going to check for one moment because we were having a little bit of technical difficulty with our first speaker. So are we going ahead with... Um, yeah, okay, so we're, we're going to start, um, we were originally going to start, we've got a, vic a presentation from set in Victoria, one in Western Australia, um, someone speaking from Western Australia and someone from um, New Zealand, and I'll introduce all those people. We were originally going to start with the Victorian one, but we're actually going to change plans a little bit and jump over to Western Australia, um, but we will hear from that kind of local context from a broader Australian um, WA context and then across um, from New Zealand as well. Uh, so bear with me one moment. So uh, I would like to um, introduce um, the Gondwana link. Um, I'm not sure if many of you have heard of the Gondwana link before, but it's a really exciting project that we've been hearing about the work of since about the early 2000s. Um, and it's really, really great to have them here tonight. Um, so the Gondwana link in Western Australia aims to reconnect country from the Cary forests of the Southwest to the woodlands and Mallee bordering the Nullarbor Plain. This area is more than a thousand kilometres long, so a really big area and links major national parks such as the Stirling Ranges, Fitzgerald Ranges and the Porongorups. They aim to restore the gaps between remnant bushland and in turn restore key ecosystem functions and processes. They also connect different groups of people across this vast area. Starting in 2002, this project was recently listed as one of the founding 50 projects under the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. We're honoured to have Gondwana Link CEO Keith Bradby speaking to us tonight. Uh, and we understand that while Gondwana Link has won awards over the years, Keith himself was granted an OAM for his services to the environment in 2015. Gondwana Link started in 2002 and Keith was there at the very beginning. 
So I'm going to say welcome to you, Keith, and I'm going to pass over to you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, great to be here. I'll just do my damnedest to wrestle with a bit of technology and, and get the slides up. I think that's happening. And um, here we go. I hope that's good for you. It's what I need to see. Um, I'll just start to acknowledge that I'm on Wajak Noongar country. I'm actually in Perth for a couple of days. I live in Albany on the south coast. Um, we work heavily with all our um, First Nations people. Uh, love their artwork. Don't don't understand it though. And I mentioned that to my Noongar friend Craig McVie, who painted this one. He said, "Look at the title, Bradby," um, and that's. That's who I am and that's who a lot of us are. You know, a couple of hundred years in this country and we're still starting to understand, just starting to understand how it functions ecologically. Um, Thousand Kilometres of Hope is how we badge our program. I thought you'd, um, you'd appreciate seeing some of our weird and wacky plants. I'm a, talking to a largely Victorian audience. Um, Ballarat is my home, home turf. That's where I grew up. And um, I was living up in Molden in Central Vic for a few years when I decided to go west, young man, and be a beekeeper and then hit this stuff in the Fitzgerald Park and I'm still here. It's, it's pretty magnificent. Um, and just, I will just mention, it's a thousand kilometre program, over 900 kilometres of which is already existing habitat. So we're ambitious, we're just not crazy. Um, there's, there's Australia, here's where we are down in the southwest. Um, it's a, a modus map of, of biomass in January one year. Pretty good picture of Australia, a few damp bits around the edge, some bloody not so damp bits in the middle. Um, and then there's the, the, the in-between country, the light green. And you, if you look closely at the southwest, you'll see we've got a a, a created desert, if you like, at least in terms of biomass production, which is our wheat belt that sits between um, some of the green and some of the, the deeper collars. That's where we work. A few things on southwestern Australia. It is a, a global biodiversity hotspot where exceptional concentrations of endemic species have undergone and are undergoing exceptional loss of habitat. It's, it's a place of discovery. In the time I've been here, we've more than doubled the plant list. Same thing, every time anyone looks for invertebrates, they find a whole heap of, of stuff no one's ever seen before. It just keeps going on and on. And recently, offshore from where I live, um, we um, found the main feeding ground. A, friend, a few friends bumped into the main feeding ground of orcas in the Southern Hemisphere. Rainfall, 1,000 mil on the west coast, 200 mil inland. It's about half a million square kilometres, so that's twice the size of Victoria or in the old money, seven times Tasmania. Um, sparse rural population, 2.6 million total, 2 million live in Perth. Most of the others live in the four main, maybe five main cities and we have some of it, we compete with Queensland to have some of Australia's most conservative electorates. So the Gone Wild Link, just a crazy scratch on the map that said, look, wet, you know, the, the ancient lineal pathway that species evolved along was between the wet and the dry. We've nearly broken it. Let's see if we can put it back together again. And we have some well positioned national parks that help to make that easy. Yeah. Um, our, our vegetation, our original habitat has suffered the same stresses as in the rest of Australia and the loss of mammals and the loss of huge areas of habitat. But for reasons I don't fully understand, the southwest corner of continents is copying the drying and warming effects of climate change um, much more severely than other areas. We're already 15 to 20 percent down on our long term rainfall. This has been happening since mid 1970s and we are getting a bit warmer and inland gets more frost and so on. So we have put Gonwale Link across the climate gradient. We hope it's big enough to make a difference beyond people. Um, we, um, it's got most of the remaining habitat areas and the hottest spots in the biodiversity hotspot 
it's the south where species are going to move and we're, we're interested in that long-term genetic persistence rather than annual migratory or a few rare species. Um, this is the sort of painful large picture thinking I think we now need in this climate emergency. Um, I just want to give thanks to India and Antarctica. Um, if they hadn't keep bumping into the southwest of Australia over the millennia as Gondwana moved around, we wouldn't have some mountains and bumpy bits and the whole bloody lot would have been cleared. So our trajectory um, closely mirrors the main stress zone of you know, the last billion or so years of, of geological activity. And we've also recently realising that a lot of the biological richness is in the farmland areas, the country that um, was cleared. We are largely a privately funded arrangement. Um, government doesn't seem to want to do ambitious stuff. So since inception, we've relied on goodwill and generosity. Um, there are some of the people who've helped and um, some of the wonderful organisations currently keeping our core program going, including um, a wonderful one from Melbourne, of course, the Ian Potter Foundation. Who are we? Well, we're a small core team that works across a whole myriad of groups and we don't do it through an overly formal structure. And some groups we work with intensively for a period of time, then they're off and rolling and we start working with other groups. Some groups are really enthusiastic at the beginning and think they can do better elsewhere. It's a bit of a moving feast, but we have been closely involved with, with over 50 organisations, businesses and individuals um, to date. The organisation itself has six clear functions, build profile and attract resources, um, find those funds and attract resources and support, um, try and get funds out to the groups that need them most, um, run a bit of a drafting gate to match potential donors and investors with opportunities that can work really well. We'd love to be setting better standards for restoration and monitoring and evaluating, but you know we're concentrating on getting stuff done and we don't have a lot of spare resource for that. We do look for where the critical gaps are, not just in the ecosystems, but where there is a group who can't do something that we can help build up or where, I'll give you some examples as we go through. And of course, we've been here 21 years and that's a lot longer than the normal electoral cycle of a lot of environmental policies. Now I want to take you to a, a rather magnificent place and now known as the Great Western Woodlands, the eastern side of the link between our wheat belt and the Nullarbor. 16 million hectares of largely intact woodland, mallee, heathland, granites, salt lakes. Um, it's lovely. Um, but pretty ignored and unknown until the, the 2000s where we worked with the Wilderness Society and um, these gentlemen here and their organisations. Fella in the middle is Alexander Watson who pulled together the, the, the science that was sort of already out there but a bit loose. Um, Harry Recker, some of you would know, came up with the name the Great Western Woodlands. Um, and we launched it. The Minister for Environment got all excited and launched it during an election campaign in 2008. From the very beginning, we'd been working with the Naju people. Um, I should, should say, there's other two guys some of you would recognise, um, solid Victorians, Barry Trail and um, Michael Looker. Um, so a mixture of Alexander, some Victorians, some WA groups and some American money, and we've got the largest remaining temperate woodland on, on earth recognised. We then spent three or four years helping government develop its strategy and spend the 3.8 million they allocated. And then that was the end of that. A bit disappointing, but that's how it works. Um, but at the same time, the Naju people of the woodlands had been in the courts for 18 years trying to establish their native title rights. Federal court came to Norseman and said, well, you've got them exclusive native title over 4.4 million hectares of the woodlands and quite a lot of the adjoining pastoral lands. And then the federal court left town. Well, fair enough, that's what federal courts do. Um, but 
Najib were keen to get going and, and get management of their country. While we're talking tonight in a restoration context, I really got to say the big bits also need restorative management. The existing bits, for a whole heap of reasons, they're, they're either threatened by various stresses, they've lost half most of their mammals and so on, and we were so keen to help these people um, get back into the game of land management. So again, pull together a, a mix of money, um, help them establish Naju Conservation Aboriginal Corporation, did a healthy country plan, set up a rural fire brigade with the Shire, started being assertive about protecting their heritage. That three trunk salmon gum there is a wanya, a water tree. It's been horticulturally modified over 500 years as a water harvesting and catchment. And um, you go to Norseman nowadays, small country town, you've got the pub, you've got the IGA, you've got the police station, the courthouse, the Shire offices, and you have the ranger base. And um, we managed that remotely for five years. Then in September 2017, Nudge took over and now run it themselves. Um, south of the woodlands is the Esperance country, um, includes the southern belt of the woodlands and a whole heap of farming country and some unbelievable coastline and islands. Um, I won't go into detail with, with the Delarac Lodgery people's work, except to say they're, they're just another magnificent group. We come in and underpin and support, help them with the Healthy Country Plan and, and a few other things. They've now developed their cultural corridor program across the Esperance Sand Plain to restore the old song lines from the woodlands um, down the rivers and out to the islands. Um, it's such a delight to work with them. I can't tell their story here. It's worthy of a few days. Um, but it's a delight to work with, again, the Melbourne-based Tiverton and Odonata groups to help Dalarac um, purchase and own some of the property and replant some of the properties along those song lines. Um, now, this is the central section of Gondwana Link. Um, Stirling Range in the middle, Walpole Wilderness on one side, the forest country, Fitzgerald River National Park on the other side. We're very proud of the fact that across all the groups and individuals and organisations, um, we've raised the funds to purchase some 23,000 hectares of farmland. Um, a lot of it was bush that was always too marginal to clear, should never have been opened up for farming. And there's about 13,000 hectares have been replanted. Now they're big numbers and it's a big effort, but it's a big landscape. And that's why I like this shot. It reminds us how much more to be done. We've probably reduced fragmentation and improved connectivity by about a third. Um, a lot more to do. Uh, the more recent properties I should have, add have been secured through carbon investment. Yeah, that helps the world climate apparently. Yes, there's an argument about offsetting, um, but carbon is an enabler and that's that's how we use it. It is helping what we need to do anyway be done. Um, there's one of those landscapes between the Fitzgerald and the Stirlings, just to give you a sense of it. There's a, a river corridor on the left, the property called Now and Up, which was mainly cliffs and breakaways and should never have been opened up for farming, but is now secured. And, and being planted back and used as a as an absolute hummer of a base for Noongar culture. There's a small 4,000 hectare nature reserve, property bush heritage owned and have replanted a 400 hectare paddock to connect it. A, um, a quite large property that's privately owned by some retired individuals, another bit of bush heritage, and then a Greening Australia property over towards the Sterling Ranges, that bump in the distance. And I should add, um, Greening Australia own the, the Now and Up property. Um, let's us planting out a bit of bush, um, modified um, Great Plains cedar, a fellow called Justin Johnson, who's an absolute bloody restoration genius. Um, anything from 50 to 100 local species picked from the adjoining vegetation communities, local provenance being direct seeded back and that's what it looks like, I think in this case, seven or eight years later. We can, in the 300 to 400 millimetre rainfall country, successfully regenerate a semblance of the bush back to the point where it has um, most of its birds coming back in and a lot of wildlife coming back in. 
but of course restoration is so much more and there's one of auntie annette starting some cultural burning um some of these properties are now Noongar occupied and the Nauna property is, is I, again, I just can't begin to tell you the wonderful stories. Those gentlemen lined up in the first year, all stolen generation survivors, many of them dead now, but they had the pleasure of going back to country and having the first dancing on country since the depression, since the thirties. And, um, and that funny animal is a, a goanna, a racehorse goanna. They come 300 metres long over here. Um, and um, it's wonderful to see the totems coming back in the landscape. About 18,000 people have been through the camps at this property since 2005. Similarly, this is an individual owned property, Eddie and Donna Wayon. Um, they bought their 540 hectares early on and every three or four months they run major surveys and camps and bring down all their mates from Perth and as our farming population decreases we believe we're actually enriching the social fabric here um, and we do have a private individual conservation landholders network of about 35 individuals who get together and swap notes um, Science, we don't spend a lot of money on science, but like the mammals and the birds, you know, you plant it and they come. And we, we work to the scientific, the ecological fundamentals, but there's been some really elegant work done on the genetics and, you know, proving, validation, if you like, of what we're doing. Um, but we're not going to get too trapped in that stuff because it can take up a lot of time and money. And I'll, I'll be blunt and say there's about 112, I think, refereed papers have come out of various aspects of, aspects of Gondwana link in the 20 years. I find less than 10% useful, but the genetic work was wonderful. Um, we don't do much in the forests. We don't have to. There's plenty of other people who've been focused there for a very long time. WA is very proud to have largely ceased logging in the forest and Jess Beckling, my good mate there, is one of the heroes who's helped it happen. Um, on the far western side, again, just a quick mention, um, we support southern forest land care and, and nature conservation Margaret River, mainly with advice and encouragement. Margaret River is really interesting in that it's, it's one of our population bulge areas, but a magnificent group. Um, the, the critically endangered western ringtail possum still flourishes there. The main population of masked owl in Western Australia is around the town site and a very active group are helping us all learn how to live with wildlife. Um, few issues to deal with, um, juvenilization of the forests through fire. That's um, our wettest forest, the Tingle Forest. Most of the old giants are, are being knocked over by continued prescribed fire and we're getting juveniles and if I thought I had time for more slides, I would have put in similar impacts happening in the Great Western Woodlands. We are now in a dry place, a much drier place, lower relative humidity, fires are burning like they never have before, and we're not yet on top of this significant ecological stress. Uh, while I'm on the bad news, um, government's continuing to build the barrier fences to stop the emu migrations. Um, there's a before photo, I've got the after photo, where they're just mounds of rotting flesh, poor buggers. And I, the, the map basically as recently as 2014, we had two shire councils lobbying government for another half million hectares of the Great Western Woodlands to be opened up for agriculture. And it's really hard to work cooperatively with everyone when you've, you've also got to deal with major issues like this. But there's a lot to celebrate. We're putting a lot of effort into celebrating it. We've got a film you can, of social and ecological restoration. You can Google and pull down from Ronan Films, Breathing Life into Butcher. Butcher is country. We're doing a sculpture trail of Noongar and evolutionary sculptures featuring on the, the Western science. We've recently danced across the link, five dances for over two weeks from Margaret River to Kalgoorlie and we run a, a restoration tourism website. And I don't think I've got time to read all these out, but I'll leave them there and you can you can look through them in the um, on the recording when you've got lots and lots of leisure because you've got nothing much else on. 
but there has been a lot learnt um, by us, by Sophie, by Amon, and you'll hear more from them. And I, as much as we've achieved, and we are proud of what we've achieved, I take the view that all we've really done is built the foundations that we can now start building the future that we need in the time of ecological loss and, and climate change. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Keith. That was very, very inspiring. I feel like jumping on a plane and flying over to WA and joining you and Gondwana Link because it's just incredible the amount of knowledge that um, has come out of those projects and the amount of people that you've brought together. Um, I'm sure Thank many you. of you will want to go back and <laughs> rewatch the recording, which brings me to the point that a few people are struggling to um, see the um, slides. I don't think that's coming from our end. I think it might be um, individual tech problems. Um, so you can try like jumping out and jumping back in, but you just um, rest assured that this is being recorded. And so um, if you feel like you're missing out, the recorded version will have all the slides and information. Um, and um, I'm sure we'll hear some more from Keith during the question time time panel discussion at the at the conclusion of this webinar, um, which is another reminder to if you do have specific questions um, for Keith um, or any of the others as we go along, please pop them in the chat box because it gives us a chance to collect them and some of the panelists might even respond to you in the chat box if they get the chance to do that before the end of the um, before the panel session. Uh, so we zoomed over to Western Australia um, to begin and we're going to zoom back to Victoria uh, where um, Trust for Nature is uh, and we're going to go to our next speaker um, but a little bit of um, context first. So Victoria is the most densely populated state in Australia and it's really exciting to see landscape scale thinking here uh, with the Biolinks Alliance. The Biolinks Alliance restores and reconnects large landscapes across central Victoria by partnering with and building the capacity of environmental groups and networks. So that really clever bringing together of people like we saw with the Gondwana link as well. Um, Biolinks Alliance was founded in 2010 to try to address the scale of restoration work required to halt environmental and species decline. The Biolinks Alliance is part of the Great Eastern Ranges Corridor Initiative, um, and today we are really, really pleased to have Sophie Bickford speak to us about the project. Sophie has a long history in conservation ecology at Adelaide Uni, CSIRO, Monash Uni, and she was previously um, the chief scientist for Carbon Planet. She's been the executive director of Biolinks Alliance since its inception in 2010, and we're really fortunate to hear from her today. So I'm going to pass over to you, Sophie, and say welcome. Thanks very much for that intro. Um, I have started sharing my screen. Can anybody see it? Oh, not yet. You can. So you can see a slide, my first slide. Yeah, you're good to go, Sophie. Fabulous. Thank you, everybody. Um, we had a few tech issues at the start, but they've thankfully all wound out. Um, you know, thanks for that introduction and Keith for your talk. Um, really exciting um, stuff you're doing. I've been such an inspiration for us. Um, uh, I, before I begin, I want to acknowledge um, the Tungurong and the Jajawarung people whose land I'm calling in on from today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. And I also want to acknowledge and thank Trust for Nature for canvassing this topic at this critical time. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I hope today I can uh, leave you with a sense of hope because I'm going to be talking about um, a community-led and community and philanthropic trust-funded initiative. Um, like you, Keith, we've mainly relied on almost um, the community to drive this and fund this, this initiative. Um, uh, but I, I feel that there's strength in that. I really feel that there's a message behind that, um, that despite not having big buckets of public funding, this project has developed over the, you know, slowly but surely over the time um, it's been around. And that's a real demonstration of the profound willingness there is in the community to innovate and to do more for nature. And, and I think it's that this community commitment that's really going to be critical um, uh, critical for us to restore big. Um, I thought I'd begin by reminding ourselves just why we have to go big in central Victoria. Um, we have a lot to lose if we don't. Uh, central Victoria is a special place. I don't have amazingly um, strange plants to show like Keith does, 
um, and a lot of you are probably from Victoria and you know you know how special it is here. But I'll just say that um, there are over 2,000 plant and animal species in the central Victorian region that we are working. Um, and, and that's more than Europe. So we're dealing with an incredibly um, a diverse region, um, unique diversity. Um, but we've already lost 26 of those animals to extinction and a further 198 are threatened with extinction. Uh, 575 plant species are threatened and insects, well, we can only guess how many of those are in trouble because no one's actually counting, but we think they're in trouble too. We know they are. Um, uh, I'm afraid um, the biogeographer's coming out in me a little bit and I just want to um, sort of really just use this occasion to really... Sophie, stress. sorry, I'm just going to interrupt for one moment. Um, we've just yeah. got the first slide that you had up. Um, we haven't got the... I'll just... I'm not sure if that's just me, though. It might be... Um, others might be yeah. seeing it. So I just didn't want you to... Um, yeah, yeah, thank miss you. Out on um, your slides. Okay, let me see if I can change it. It's a bit of a... No, it's me counting my eggs before, you know, that one. I, I'm really sorry. How oh, about no, that? it's working now. Yeah, yeah, Ooh, that's fantastic. Good, good, good. Must have been sorry, I should hours. have interrupted okay. earlier. I just wasn't sure if I'm... Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Okay, okay. Keep so going. You missed the alarming slide, everyone. Probably everyone's relieved about that. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about really why it's so important that we have to go big before telling you about how we're going big in central Victoria. Um, so in, in the case of biodiversity, conservation size certainly matters. And um, I, I just just want to show that, you know, just talk about this a little bit before I get going, because we find that one of the main things that we're doing um, to scale up conservation is mobilising people to care more and understand that any local action uh, really is going to, is what's needed to build um, the bigger picture restoration that we need. And so often we um, work hard on working out how we can communicate um, just how significant um, those small steps in people's local areas are and often explaining the big context and just, just what people are contributing to um, and how important that is, is, is a really strong uh, motivator. So um, we, we do often talk about, um, you know, just why size matters so much, you know, uh, why we need to scale up our conservation efforts. Um, so, yes, yeah, size matters. Native species populations naturally fluctuate. And, and if population numbers are high, this fluctuation is of no dramatic consequence. But if populations are low in the first instance, a population... Um, number downturn can really result in the in can result in the extinction of that species. So the graph with the white and red wiggles is a graphical re re representation of this. You can see that um, the red line you've got a downturn and and you can crash out and and lose lose a species with one of those natural um, perturbations. But and and look, this is particularly important in in a. a a state like Victoria, where we have lost so much of our native vegetation cover on our habitat. 66% um, of the, the state is cleared. Um, and of course, there's a direct correlation between the amount of habitat area and the number of um, and, and species population sizes. So um, we really need to restore, um, increase the amount of habitat uh, to, to buffer um, our species populations from, from extinction events. We need, we need to go, um, we need to in increase our, you know, the amount of habitat and the types of habitat in those areas that aren't currently um, well represented um, uh, in our in our reserve system that we've currently got, so representation matters too. Um, just like Keith said, um, much of the biological richness concurs with the agricultural areas in in WA, and it's certainly the same um, is 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 true in in Victoria too. So. Um, Representation definitely matters. Uh, we need to scale up um, our restoration efforts around those underrepresented ecological communities that actually often concur with our with our um, farming lands, our, our, our public estate, private estate. And look, I've got another uh, a paper here that I just want to show you, just to, that shows um, really brings 
home how important scaling up restoration on private land is. Um, if we want to have a have a show at um, conserving threatened species, um, we 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 need to acknowledge that that over 50% of them occur on these areas that are not currently protected. They are, their ranges are primarily on private land. Um, this is a study that looked at the 2000 odd uh, listed threatened species in Australia and, and have a look at the yellow on that graph. That's um, the proportion of different species groups that occur only on private land. So this reinforces the need for more big restoration on private land. And of course, connectedness matters. And, and I think Keith made that point that climate change is really making that all the more important. Um, and, and this is a, just another study that I like to sort of um, use occasionally to demonstrate the scale that we need to reconnect the landscape at so that species can um, adapt to climate change and, and, and move in response to, to, to more suitable climates. This is um, a study of the shifting bird ranges in Australia since 1950, um, looking at about 500 different species. And those ranges have shifted, the median the centre point of those ranges have shifted over distances of between 200 and 400 kilometres along climat climatic gradients over the last 50 years. And so that's just with 0.8 degrees warming. And we know we're going into a much more rapidly and, and even you know a, a greater warming climate. So we can expect for species if they if movement isn't an option for them um, to adapt to climate change to be moving over these really, really large scales. And so that's that's sort of letting us know what sort of scale we're needing to reconnect our landscapes up at. Um, and of course, um, there are benefits beyond just for biodiversity, um, securing biodiversity in restoring landscapes at big scales. There's also the 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 um, the, the help that the drawing down carbon benefits and and and, and um, contributing to um, sort of really, uh, helping the climate change crisis um, at, at the same time. So how do we scale up big? Well, in central Victoria, with so much land under private control, going big will take mobilising the community, empowering the community to act in their spheres of influence. Um, so we're going to need to incorporate biodiversity much better into our farming systems, into our towns, into our gardens. Um, we need to abandon the Western notion that humans are here and nature's over there. We really need to learn how to coexist a lot um, better with nature like our um, traditional owners did for millennia before us. Um, but I also want to point out that it will take more than just individual ac actions. It will take new mm -hmm. forms of organisations um, to support um, the coordination of those individual efforts that are going to add up to the big changes we need. Um, we're going to need new network organisations that help us learn from each other, that bring together the, the intelligence of the collective to solve these complex problems and, and to collaborate at impact at scale. And um, I think Biolinks Alliance is a network organisation that has been set up to offer scientific expertise and leadership to support communities to learn and collaborate and act strategically for nature um, and to enable communities to better partner with all the other stakeholders that are needed to make this happen with government, with other conservation organisations, so that we can urgently scale up our landscape restoration efforts. Um, as uh, was outlined in the introduction, we were formed around 19, uh, 2010 um, by um, some local community organisations in central Victoria. Um, we've grown in that time. We, we've got um, eight, eight expert staff. I've got to say we're, we're all part time, but you know, there's eight of us on board now. Um, and we're an alliance of 18, um, growing almost 20, uh, member community environment groups, land care and conservation management networks, friends of groups that um, uh, uh, work across central Victoria. Um, we essentially work where our members work. Our westernmost member is Project Platypus, um, an umbrella um, uh, organisation for a number of land care groups working in the in the northern Grampians region, over to our easternmost 
um, member group in the Strathbogie Rangers, the Strathbogie Rangers Conservation Management Network. And then we have uh, member groups that work along the ranges and slopes of the Great Divide, moving right through the central Victoria, almost up to the Murray River. Um, as mentioned earlier, we, we uh, partners with the Great Eastern Rangers um, Connectivity Conservation Initiative, and, and we work closely with this fantastic and even larger scale conservation collaboration. So we, we're sort of this blob in the middle of that map. So how we work, we can our work can sort of be classed in four general areas, and, and all these areas need to be brought together um, to build the cons strong conservation communities um, that we need to restore landscapes. Um, <clears throat> knowledge sharing and networking is, is one of our key, key programs and the one that's probably the most developed and I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. But we've also been developing over the last few years pilot landscape repair projects and I want to mention a few of those. And obviously we play that sort of brokering and partnership role and, and, we, and, and also um, advocacy for large landscape conservation and supporting um, communities to play, um, play a stronger role in it. So knowledge sharing and network building is one of the areas that we focus much on. We hold an annual knowledge symposium for our network members. Um, the, the, this network event um, accesses and shares broadly the wealth of expertise held that within our network and also brings in specialist relevant research from you know, research providers like universities and other research institutions, and together increasing our ecological um, literacy, uh, the ecological literacy of, of, of the conservation community in central Victoria. And so we've held them on uh, biolink design, um, terrestrial landscapes, um, and watery landscapes. We've held them around uh, restoring ecological, how we restore ecological function to damaged landscapes, um, how we bolster our refuges, where the future climate refuges are going to be, and um, also around um, uh, around flagship species, um, uh, gliders are the ones that we've had a couple of very, um, very uh, successful large um, symposia on because there's so much interest in the species. Um, they're a great flagship species for reconnecting landscapes because their movements directly embody the rules for ecological connectivity. So um, they're a species that everybody loves and, and uh, easily observable. Um, and, and so they're great to develop sort of conservation projects around that restore habitat and connectivity. Um, we also hold high profile speaker events that bring in thought leaders um, around connectivity conservation, um, science and practice to, to raise the profile and inspire and build local knowledge on why we need to connect habitats and, and how it can be done. Um, and and we also and more recently been wanting to start conversations that we really need to have about new approaches to to doing this business. Um, uh, we had one recently on rewilding in central Victoria, asking the question, could this approach um, restore nature at the scale and pace we need? And these types of events are designed to engage people in conversations that are key to generating bottom up movements for for larger scale changes. Um, this rewilding event we recently had attracted 170 people at 11 a.m. on a freezing cold Sunday morning in, in May in Kyneton. Um, and in, it's an incredible interest in topics and, and we think we'll run our next symposia on this topic because um, one of the main comments we got back that it was just too short. Um, so there's enormous interest out there for people to join the conversations and, and, and get involved. And we make the content from our symposia and all our, all our knowledge events available on, on our um, online knowledge hub for, for, you know, for more broader sharing and, and people to pick up at any other time. So the other area that we've been putting um, much of our resource into is developing um, the tools and systems that support the community to collaborate around um, conservation issues in their landscapes and, and to partner. Um, and we've been trialling and evaluating um, these in pilot landscape, over in pilot landscape restoration areas and projects. There's a few sort of mapped on that slide there, and I just want to talk about a couple of them tonight. But before I Jackie, do, I'm just going to um, jump in really quickly. I think if you can um, try and 
um, bring the last couple of slides into about two minutes, just so we have time for our um, last speaker and for the panel at the end. Sorry, I know that you lost a little bit of time with the slides there, but okay, um, take take a couple of minutes to um, to finish up. But yeah, really sure. fascinating. Great. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, we've de developed the local to landscape conservation planning system, which is essentially bringing um, you know, the critical needs of plants and animals together with communities that are best placed to protect them. Um, so it's the only conservation planning tool that puts communities front and centre and focuses on building their capacity to um, restore landscapes at scale. And uh, we, essentially the process, it's one of, of engagement and of learning um, and then um, supporting collaboration and um, this is a project that we did uh, sort of around the Kyneton region. It was instigated by a Trust for Nature land covenant holder who had covenanted her property at Green Hill near Kyneton. And she was doing amazing work protecting and restoring the property, but she realised that if she was going to realise her goals of having koalas once again um, on that property, she needed to... Um, she needed others to be doing the same. And so we found some funding and engaged with other landowners in it and developed a, a collaborative plan. And part of these plans um, is really supporting the group in building their capacity to begin implementing them. And, and so pilot restoration projects that are sort of piloting sort of uh, more novel um, restoration interventions are key parts of the process and we design them to demonstrate um, how we can repair landscapes um, and or, or ecosystems uh, in these landscapes and, um, and, 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 and bring in as many people to learn from those projects to um, catalyse their further uptake in the, broad, in the broader region. So, um, yeah, and, and the, the, essentially the, the, the process um, I'm sorry. Just go back we minute. might actually have to wrap it up there, Sophie. I'm so sorry. Um, if you hopefully, if you had extra things you wanted to um, chat about or to finish off your presentation, there might be a chance in the panel discussion to bring those topics up. Um, but oh. I'm just conscious that we need to get to the um, to our last speaker as well, and then have time for questions because there's just so many great questions and comments coming through the chat. So I don't want to run out of time for those at the end. I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, no worries. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. I feel like um, there's there's so many things that BioLinks Alliance and Trust for Nature are on the same page about, which I think can only be a good sign, and um, also the Gondwana link as well. Um, and I just love that idea of really valuing um, really small actions and then seeing the sort of some of the parts, and um, it's a really exciting way of, of looking at um, how we can approach some change. Um, so we're now going to travel virtually uh, 2,500 kilometres to the east to our brothers and sisters across the ditch. Uh, New Zealand has a long history of restoring really large areas and restoring species, and they do it really well. Uh, we were particularly keen to bring an international perspective to this webinar, um, and there's a lot we can learn from our next speaker. So we're delighted to be joined tonight by Eamon Nathan, uh, the General Manager of Reconnecting Northland. Reconnecting Northland brings communities, agencies and resources together to support thriving ecosystems across Northland, New Zealand. Established in 2012, this organisation works with partner groups on several projects to reconnect landscapes so that land and people flourish together. Eamon is a builder of communities and we are excited to see the weaving in of culture of the people and the spirit of the land in this project. What a fabulous quote from Eamon, that building a better world does not need to be wasteful, expensive or tedious, but rather is a joyful celebration that builds sustained value and nourishes earth. We really appreciate Eamon speaking to us tonight and are very grateful for the different experiences and insights from New Zealand and acknowledge that this is now very late for Eamon to be joining us. Um, hopefully you're still awake, Eamon, and I'm going to say um, welcome to you. Greetings, everybody, from uh, Northland, Whangarei, New Zealand. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight and um, yeah, just a big mihi to um, Trust for Nature for the invitation to uh, virtually join you across the ditch um, in what we might call the West Island from this, the North Island. Um, anyway, 
it's good to see you all. Good to be here. Um, and um, I'm calling in from uh, uh, the uh, the north of Northland in Whangarei, um on the Finua, on the lands of the Ngati um, Ngati Wai, um, Ngati uh, Hau, um, um, and Ngati oh, Te Parafo uh, tribes. Um, I will start sharing soon. I'll just uh, get my slides up and where are we going, hopefully. All right, can we all see that? Yeah, we can see Um, it's in view. Oh, no, that's better. Yeah, perfect. Go Is that ahead. OK? Uh-huh, yeah. All right. So as, um, as Gabby mentioned in the uh, introduction, um, Reconnecting Northam was initiated in uh, late uh, 2012, and um, we've been fortunate enough to be independently funded um, since that time by one of our uh, founding organisations, the Tyndall Foundation, along with uh, Foundation North. Um, and I want to just a, a bigger, uh, put a big shout out to uh, Keith at this point. Um, Keith um, was part of um, those early conversations um, with the initiation of uh, Reconnecting Northern and in many ways Gondwan Link, the work that uh, Keith and all the crew over there have been doing um, has been an inspiration for Reconnecting Northland's formation. Um, I suppose simply put, uh, Reconnecting Northland um, uh, support remote communities in Taitukato and Aotearoa um, to regenerate some of the world's most biodiverse forests and wetlands, creating landscape um, or dynamic landscape change. Um, as you can see in this slide here, um, this is basically our vision. It's, uh, you can see multi-generational, um, and that is that in three generations, Northland is a flourishing tapestry of abundant and resilient ecosystems. Um, um, quite over the last sort of uh, seven years or so, we've been sort of closely looking at what are the actual issues that we're dealing with. And um, we've kind of summarised it down to these five. One is um, both uh, Sophie and Keith have talked about is fragmentation across all levels, both ecological and socioeconomic fields. Um, there's limited capacity for communities and tangata whenua, that being the um, uh, people earth or earth people, uh, the traditional peoples of these lands, Māori, uh, to bring about ecological change at scale. Um, there's limited and untimely access to the support services and administration of the ecological effort. Um, fragmented funding and comp competition for resourcing and uh, communities aren't able to address the transformative levers for systems change. So kind of looking at all of these issues that we've um, been observing here through our mahi, we've formed um, our strategy based on these four um, work streams, if you like. Um, and as our, our core strategy is a connectivity catalyst, and that's really speaking to what Sophie was talking about, these um, network organisations um, that essentially are charged with bringing the best of um, bottom-up and top-down contributions to achieve socio-ecological uh, outcomes. Um, as we know, sort of the success of solving some of the most complex um, environmental and social problems frequently hinges on the work of organisations that harmonise the action between these, these players. And that's what um, Reconnecting Northland has identified and why being a connectivity catalyst is one of our core uh, strategies. Um, the second, and these aren't in any order, and, um, but the other is uh, the second one is around Tapere. Um, Tapere is a district, a self-defined district by the people and the communities that live in those communities. And these are our sort of place-based initiatives that we support where by joining up um, community lead action across landscapes to achieve greater ecological outcomes. We've also recognised that, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, access to the services and support that these group need, groups need is limited. Um, so that informs Te Kete Honunga, which is essentially a basket of um, tools and services. That um, is our third strategy. Um, and then finally, recognising that 80% um, of conservation or uh, ecological activity in Taitukara and Northland is um, primarily reliant on grant-based funding and volunteerism. 
more particularly volunteerism. And so we want to look at ways um, to uh, help wean or create regenerative revenue streams um, for these conservation efforts. Um, and that's through our nature based enterprise strategy. So um, tonight, I'm just going to sort of explore uh, how these are how these are playing out these strategies um, and uh, provide a few examples um, along the way. So starting with Tapiri, um, some of the world's most promising ecosystem regeneration opportunities exist in the remote communities of Northland. And it's in these places that inspire our work um, uh, within the Tapere. So this map here, and by the way, this is all relative. I mean, looking at some of the scale of, um, I mean, Australia, um, uh, the work of BioLinks and, and Gondwana Link, um, the scale is, is relative. <laughs> it's nothing like these um, massive areas that you guys are dealing with over there. Nevertheless, um, these this map here, so you can see this is the North Island, um, and this is uh, the sort of the mid north of of Northland. These polygons here are areas that we're working um, and um, creating or supporting connectivity across these 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 tapere. Um, I'm going to focus in on the South Hokianga, and in particular the blue uh, area of Otowa and a little bit in Waimamaku. Um, this this uh, sorry the orange area of Otowa and the blue area of Waimamaku. Um, so in 2017, um, we started working with uh, groups in the South Hokianga around identifying what their vision was um, or is for uh, for the area. We took a long term view. Basically, we asked them to imagine what it would have been like 100 years ago. Uh, what would it, if they moved around the landscape? Then what would they see, feel, taste, smell, and hear? Um, we brought them forward into the present in 2017 and asked them the same question. And then we said, OK, cast your uh, imagination forward to 100 years from now. And what do you see, feel, taste, smell and hear? And this is the illustration that captured um, the, their vision. And so this, is, this provides the guidance, I suppose, for the initiatives that we've been working with. And as you can see, it's not purely e ecological. Um, there's all sorts of stuff captured in here. Only our, owning our own actions, which is about, you know, um, being responsible for what they do and taking local leadership. Um, obviously, forest to sea, ecological, clean, clear water, having easy access to resources, um, communication uh, and education, the two of the big ones, and Sophie spoke about that. Um, and the one that I love here is uh, being a good ancestor. So in that time, we've been working with five of the Attachments in and around the um, Hukia, South Hokianga. Um, we've supported them to create connectivity plans, or at least four of them. And um, last year we completed a significant project um, for Clean Clear Water, which uh, uh, planted out 75 hectares of uh, waterway um, uh, restoration and 75 hectares of, uh, sorry, kilometres of fencing. And these uh, young chaps were largely responsible for the delivery of the or the carrying out all the planting. Um, uh, this fella here led by this guy Storm, um, uh, who when I first met in 2017, when we were just um, initiating the idea or the concept of Hiri Poko, he was a young trapper coming off the, out of the bush as a 17 year old. And now he's um, running a, uh, a gang and one of the lead contractors of doing work over in the Okianga and Northland and beyond the region really awesome success story. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the um, how, uh, what we've learned from working with these guys. Um, just quickly, a, a map, this is the Waimamaku Valley. Um, so you can sort of see uh, the pink areas, are all the areas that have been planted and the green are the remaining areas. So just in this valley, um, over a couple of years, there was 55 kilometres um, of fencing and 55 hectares of planting. But as Keith and Sophie noted, there's always a lot more to do. Um, so I'm going to jump into some of the stuff that we're doing uh, right now. We're working um, with a group over in Otowa, uh, known as the Kohatutaka Project, um, and their catchment is um, about six and a half thousand hectares. Um, and um, so far, 
what we've um, worked on is supporting them to develop their uh, connectivity plan, which identified a number of priorities. Um, and we've honed in on a few um, that we thought or that they prioritised um, above all. Freshwater, afforestation, pest control and capability growth. Um, so we've been supporting this group with um, uh, local coordination, which is key, um, and the role of these uh, coordinators, or what we call kairaranga weavers, um, is largely described there. Um, into This is the, um, a slide of the Otowa catchment, um, and what it identifies here is um, the priority waterway areas that they're um, largely focusing on. The black polygons are all Māori owned land, so traditionally Māori owned land. Um, this is an old map. This is the waterway stuff has pretty much been done already. Um, so we're now moving on to uh, um, this uh, next phase. Um, we've supported them to complete a pest control plan. And so this overlaps, you can see some of the waterway areas here. This is the zones of um, uh, the pest control. And um, uh, you're probably all aware we've had significant uh, immigration of um, migration of possums to uh, Northland and New Zealand. And so they're one of the primary uh, targets for pest control. Um, you guys can have them back anytime you like. Uh, whilst I'm on this, I suppose I'll just take a moment to reflect. What we've learned in working with these groups on the ground, and particularly that um, a uh, bunch of um, young guys that I showed you earlier is that um, is how to support the groups on the ground through growing their capability and competency to deliver um, quality um, work on the ground. And that's largely informed um, our next um, strategy I want to talk about, Te Kete Honunga, which um, facilitates access and distribution of services and resources to where they're needed. Um, so this is an illustration of um, the concept of, of um, Te Kete Honunga. At the centre are our kairaranga. Um, these are the well networked, locally based um, uh, change agents on the ground um, who uh, work within their communities with landholders with different groups to um, facilitate the flow of the services that exist within Te Kete. Te kete is a basket of, as I said, all of these things, tools, training, services, resources, um, and funding. And what we've done and, and are trialling at the moment um, is um, curating a bunch of these um, services that the groups on the ground have identified that they need, which many of which already exist within uh, agencies and um, organisations and businesses. And we've pulled them all together into a, a virtual kete and the kairaranga um, identify what's needed on the ground and are uh, inducted into the how te kete works and what's what's um, included within te kete and um, ascertain what's needed within their communities and then support those uh, groups through those services to grow capability and, and capacity. So what this looks like as an example within uh, Otowa um, is to date uh, via the Nature Conservancy, we've supported um, them around their conservation design program training. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, supported them with their pest control plan and then uh, various ecological uh, training supports through pest control monitoring. This image here is them doing a bit of uh, freshwater monitoring um, with the um, white bait connection, um, grow safe, another sort of uh, I suppose, technical skills to make sure that they've um, uh, got the right competencies to control pests, control weeds, um, and can use chainsaws safely. Um, what's emerging now that they've got all of these on the ground skills is what are some of the more um, uh, higher level skills, if you like, that they need to be able to run their own organisations and be self-sustaining. So. What they're looking at now is governance training um, and supporting the growth of emerging leaders, um, business development support, project management to implement their tile plans, their, their connectivity plans, um, and also funding to um, implement. Um, 
couple of years ago, we completed a bit of re uh, research, which is really um, what we called Takawa Wild, and there's a report on our website that you can have a look at and download. Um, but really, that was really um, looking at um, indigenous approaches to um, uh, revitalization, I suppose, um, of landscapes. And um, by no surprise, um, what it identified is that um, uh, uh, the inspiration for um, a lot of activity on the ground is through identity, identity of um, through iconic markers, narratives of, of ident distinct identity and distinct practices, one of which is kawa. And kawa is a, is a, is a term used for um, uh, managing people's interaction with the various realms and with nature. Um, so as part of Tikete, we're um, looking at ways in which to support community groups um, to explore these um, these practices as well within their own uh, within their own areas. Eamon, I'm uh, really sorry to interrupt. Can I give you a um, a thirty second finishing up? Um, just so we've got time for a few questions at the end with the panel. Thank you so much. Okay, no worries. I can finish up on this slide. Um, uh, so this image here. Um, we launched Te Kete Honunga recently, um, and uh, one of the key, I suppose, benefits from working with um, uh, has been working with the Department of Conservation. And a big part of Te Kete Honunga is demonstrating how um, we can uh, illustrate or demonstrate how collaborative job sharing can achieve greater e efficiencies and greater coverage. And so DOC has really come to the uh, to the party, the Department of Conservation, and um, to extend our outreach team, if you like, with four of their dock rangers to work with um, groups um, outside of the tapere that we're working with um, in other parts of Northland. So there are nine other trial groups, um, DOCA working with um, uh, five of them, and then there are also the groups that we're working with. Um, I suppose just to sum up, I'm not going to read all of these, but the expected outcomes that we're seeking from this trial is um, that. One, we can support the growth of capability um, across the landscape and that the tool that we create, the model that we create is replicable and scalable, scalable not just in Northland, but across all of the country and potentially internationally as well. Um, yeah, I can wind up there. You that like, would be Abby. fantastic. Thank you, Eamon, because I'd love to um, have a chance to hear from the other panellists before we have to finish up. Um, but yeah, that was actually the point I was going to make about your presentation, how um, like those strategies that you've spent so much time and energy coming up with and your team are, seem so um, scalable to like there's so many things that we could be using over here. And I, I love the links between all three of these um, projects. There's some common themes about um, embracing people and bringing communities together and different knowledge types and using prioritization and strategy really in a clever way um, that stretch across all of our um, these three projects from our panelists. So thank you so much for that presentation. Um, so jumping right in, we've had a few questions come through on the chat and Keith has been um, a keyboard warrior typing away and um, answering them. Um, and we've got a question I might actually throw straight to you, Eamon, um, because it follows on nicely from what um, some of the things you were just talking about. Um, so it's wonderful to work with communities and local communities need to take ownership, but are we exhausting the goodwill of unfunded local people? Um, and I think that will be an interesting question for each of the panellists to have a think about. So maybe if you just want to, um, yeah, give a, a quick answer and um, I'll throw to the next person. But if you want to kick us off, Eamon, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, no, great question. Um, uh, all of the groups that we're working with, uh, we secure funding for. So the coordinators on the ground are paid um, and um, there is a degree of volunteerism, but largely the piece the piece that I didn't get to, which was the final slide, is what we're doing <laughs> to um, coordinate co-funding from a variety of angles, a variety of agencies um, to syndicate the, the various outcomes out. Because as much as what we're doing here uh, or the, the the issue that we are all dealing with is as much an ecological issue as it is a social issue. And so what we're working um, with over here or who we're working with over here are various agencies that have interest in um, social outcomes, uh, socioeconomic outcomes. And if we're able to um, um, demonstrate the connection between 
um, inputting into social outcomes that are going to deliver on ecological outcomes, we're able to sort of, uh, I suppose, diversify the investment suite, if you like. Um, and then we're also added, adding to that, looking at how that can then leverage private investment um, and as uh, um, Keith indicated, um, utilising the ETSC um, emissions trading scheme over here. Pros and cons, but as he said, it's an enabler. So we're looking at how we can diversify the revenue streams beyond just the usual suspects of um, what you might call the, the environmental sector. Fantastic answer. Thank you, Eamon. Um, Sophie, what would you say to that to that question? Um, and I'm happy to repeat it. Um, yes, well, it, it, it is an issue. It's a big issue. Um, and um, I think um, our local community organisations, th this space needs leaders. And um, our lo local community organisations are absolutely precious and they're not being supported well enough. And burnout's a real issue. Um, and if you lose one of your key people, it can really collapse a, a whole kind of, you know, <laughs> pro programs and activity in a particular region. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're having to rely on volunteerism way too much. Um, the job's too big and too important to do so. And, um, well, yeah, there's a certain ability that the community can give and do, we could achieve so much more with just a small amount of funding. And it needn't be enormous amounts we're talking about here. We're talking about relatively modest funding to support, you know, these, these collaborations with a facilitator and someone to help access additional funds. And, and, you know, I mean, there are ways to get this rolling without a hell of a lot more money. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a real shame that, you know, I think we're not we're not growing our land care movement and and supporting it because it really is a special thing that we've got in Australia to build from to do to deliver large landscape mm -hmm. conservation um, and and it really would be a cost effective way to spend some money to get some you know much greater environmental outcomes and impacts from all the the, the amazing willingness that's there. Yeah, absolutely I agree with everything you said, Sophie. Um, Keith, do you have anything to add um, in response to that question about oh, exhausting? Oh, this, this could go on for a bit. Um, number one, I, I am seeing significant, I guess you'd say, inequalities ac across the sector. Um, I agree with what Sophie said in, in, entirely. In the Australian context, we we built this incredible land care movement. We had the the local skills, the long-term knowledge, and you had the the, the really fantastic efficiencies. Um, and then from about 2000, 2005 onwards, we've largely abandoned it. They have trouble getting core funding. They've got to live off projects, death by a thousand projects and so on. And um, it's untenable for local communities to continue in that way. And they are, I make the point that we got our program going by the support of large organisations, but I see its long-term future is maintained by the local communities whose priorities don't change. It's all about place. Um, but we've got to acknowledge that there's another end of the spectrum where, um, you know, to, to be banal about it, we're not expecting volunteers to man the submarines when we get them eventually, and neither should we... Um, expect that of restoration of the ecology of Australia. The larger groups we work with, you know, there's, there's a stark difference there. You've got pretty well-funded, well-supported, nice new vehicles, sort of folk able to go around and do stuff. And um, and that's great. And But, but the, the local community sector in Australia is being used. And I'd also add quickly, um, we're not dealing with the regulatory barriers. If we, well, a friend recently bought out of his own money, a 330 hectare property on a river, badly degraded. He's replanting it this year. Took him seven months to get through the planning hurdles. And I've made some noises about that. And people have said, well, what do you want? And I don't want an adjustment. I want a red carpet. We're doing what the world needs. And there's no yeah, red absolutely. carpet to help support people get on and do it yeah exactly um as hannah i guess has commented in the chat exactly um so 
really leading into that question, um, that's talking about all of these volunteers on the ground um, who are giving up so much of their time because they're passionate. Um, but sort of on the flip side, you've each got long term projects that um, the founders have poured a lot of um, time and energy into. Um, and the question came through in the chat um, is how are the various speakers managing succession for their long term projects? Um, so thinking, I guess, less about your volunteers and more about keeping your project alive and healthy. Um, and we might kick back off to you, Eamon. I'm sorry, just keeping in mind, we've just got um, a few minutes left for the chat. So um, if you can keep your answers brief, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a million dollar question, um, really. And Keith and I and Literally. me, Sophie, just recently, we, we started to delve into that, but it was going to be a couple of days before we'd um, end the conversation and then some. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, one thing that we have done is we've uh, established um, Reconnecting Northland Enterprises. Um, so we are a charity, a charity at present, and we've established a, an enterprise arm, and um, we're looking at a couple of options around how we can, um, uh, I suppose, commercialise some of the things that we're doing, um, as well as uh, um, leverage off um, some of the investments that we're initiating into uh the re regeneration projects uh, that can sort of help uh contribute a percentage to the, the service that we provide um it's all and it's very much in its infancy but that's one of the things that we're looking at as well as international funding um overseas thanks Simon. yeah that makes a lot of sense um and sophie what what would you say to that question um Look, it is a problem. I'm, I'm trying to employ um, young, keen people. Um, there are people who don't want to work for government, don't want to go into consulting and are really inspired by the type of work we're doing and, and appreciate the, you know, the breadth and the, of, of the things that they can get over and the, the creativity, these sort of organisations and freedom they can give. And so we, we get amazing hires. We've got an incredible team of people. Um, again, it's just finding that that business model to, that that builds that sustainability into the organisation. Um, it's it's a real trick. Um, I'm happy to bud off and go and do other things when the organisation's in good hands and those people are coming through. Um, they just don't want to work for peanuts like I have been, and, and they can't afford to. They're young people who've got young families and mortgages and and things like that. But I I think the groundswell and the wills there. We just have to work out the business models to support these people to come through. Yeah, thank you for that answer, Sophie. And um, Keith, do you have anything to add? Oh, yes, we do need to build the business models. Um, we're 21 years old this year. We'd like to mature into adulthood. <laughs> um, we've got a great business model here that has been extremely successful in bringing in significant private funds, 90 to 100 million, we estimate. Um, but no one wants to fund the core. Not many people want to fund. Sorry, I've got to apologise to a few people out there who may be on. Some people get it and, and are happy to fund the core, but... We operate on a sacrificial basis. Let me be absolutely blunt. And and it's a tenuous basis. And it's really hard to see how we we build it as a, a an ongoing it, it's our big weakness. It's our big weakness, that exact one. Um you know, so it's Keith, a program, um, not a project that we need yeah, funding and for. Just to just to sum up on on what you're saying right there, um, sorry to butt in on you. Um, no, what, no. Like, what does success look like for you and your organisation? Um, and if you, everyone, uh, the other panelists can give a, a one sentence response before we um before we have our concluding remarks. What does success well, look like? Well, if I can, while I'm going. Yeah, um, keep going, keep going. Yes. Success is redundancy, right? We don't need to keep going. It's happened, and it's a self-sustaining system out there. I can give you numbers on how much, how many more hectares and all that sort of stuff, but it's basically a self-sustaining ecosystem that doesn't need 200 of us running around in white utes to maintain the odd rare thing or whatever. That's a perfect and, answer, um, Keith. Thank yeah. you. Um, and Sophie, what does success look like for you for BioLinks Alliance? 
Uh, look, in the next 10 years, um, I, you know, I, I'd love to see lots of our local landscapes all over central Victoria with every conservation community paired with an ecologist, a young ecologist that can provide that ecological support yes. Um, yes. to have funders that are willing to jump on board to these fabulous, really well articulated projects. Yeah, thumbs up from Keith there. there. Yeah, so, agreed, agreed, agreed. Um, and Eamon, five second answer. What's success look oh. like for you? Is that too hard? <laughs> well, we've set it in our vision, a flourishing tapestry, um, self-sustained, thriving yeah. ecosystems. Yeah, absolutely. Here's my five seconds. Uh, thank you. That was perfect. Uh, so I just want to say a humongous thank you to all of our three guest speakers. You're all doing amazing work and all three of your projects are very, very inspiring. I'm sure a lot of people took a lot of inspiration today. Um, thanks for the questions. That's all we'll have time for tonight. This webinar was recorded and will be available on the Trust for Nature website. Search under John Paul Memorial Lectures to see this and our past lectures. Thanks to our three speakers, Sophie, Keith and Eamon, for um, their conservation work and for speaking to us this evening. Uh, thanks to Nikki Munro for all the work she put into this evening. And again, we're sorry she wasn't able to be with us tonight, um, although I did see her name pop up somewhere, so she may have joined um, in from, from her bed. Uh, and it's amazing what we can achieve when we work together, connecting people People, land and landscapes. And finally, thank you to our wonderful listeners for attending tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our lectures as much as I did. Um, and we'll see you at the next John Paul Memorial Lecture. Thank you and good night.